I'm so happy that Richard Whitaker has joined us today. As an artist, Richard Whitaker has laid hands on paint, clay, and camera. But with degrees in philosophy and clinical psychology and graduate studies at the Graduate Theological Union, he presents a figure interested in a broad and deep exploration of life. So it may seem a comfortable fit that upon arriving in the Bay Area in 1966, Richard ran a poetry program in Haight-Ashbury. In the early 1980s, he was art director for Loft, Loft Publishing. Then he set out and founded Step Gallery in Oakland, co-founding the 1350 Upstairs Gallery in Alameda. And then became the founding editor of The Secret Alameda, went on to publish for the Nonprofit Society for the Recognition of Art, Recognition of Art, and works on and conversations. And, and I think Richard has some of his um, current publication works and conversations for us today here. A unique publication, which is to be dearly cherished. He's also West Coast editor of Parabola, and um, I hope you've had a chance to see the current exhibition that he has curated at the Berkeley Art Museum, Local Treasures. With independent eyes and hands and heart, Richard Whitaker curates and illuminates our contemporaries. Richard, thank you. Thank you, I'm, uh, I'm very, very Pleased to be here with you all today, and uh, it's been so interesting to listen to Leo and Mildred. You know, um, you know that introduction about me sounds really incredible as I hear it. But one of the things that's clear to me, and it might not seem so to you, but wow, that guy must be pretty confused. I mean, <laughs> I mean all those different things. And um, I would say, you know, my route to sitting here today has been a long and winding path. And uh, I would, you know, as artists, I, I feel that when I'm with artists, I'm kind of with my people. It took me a long, quite a while to actually realize that. Sometimes people ask me, are you an artist? And I'm always kind of hesitant because a lot of artists, maybe quote most artists, have a kind of relatively well-defined sort of genre that they work in. But uh, all of all of us, and and all of us artists, are we have all kinds of uh, skills usually, and our creative capacity is at work probably in all areas of our life, uh, hopefully. But then we get recognized for a certain thing, and that's how it works, as we know in this culture. And uh, as, a, as a young person, I was absolutely not finding the, the uh, right category that seemed to fit what, for me, was uh, this need to, to have a life that f was meaningful. And um, maybe everybody in this room is lucky enough to have held out for a life of meaning. Um, some, for some people, it's maybe a shorter, easier route to find a kind of um, engagement in the world that, that, that supplies a kind of life of meaning. For others, it's a lot more difficult. And in this culture, it's very difficult, I think, to find a vocation. Now, I, I use that word vocation in the sense of a calling. Um, A.K. Kumar Swami, this very interesting uh, man who was a scholar of traditional society and Eastern uh, art said that you can measure the uh, health of a culture by the percentage of people in it who have a calling, a vocation. He says in traditional societies, this is what Kumar Swami says, in traditional societies everyone has a, a vocation. And the society is sort of set up so that the elders watch the children and that, that kid seems to like to go fishing and this one here is like building and it sort of naturally sort of leads people to what is their best gift. In this culture, as we know, uh, many, most, maybe most people are not that satisfied with their work. I mean, very few people 
would say about their work that this is my vocation. In any case, uh, I kind of feel like I found a vocation uh, in, in this little magazine I published, which is Works and Conversations. There's a few over there in that box. Please feel free to take a copy. That's the current issue. Um, I feel very, very fortunate because uh, I, I'm able to do this thing and uh, I've never made any money doing it. So to be able to do something and not be making money is a real privilege. And how, how I got, <laughs> how, and I don't come from, a, I'm not a, uh, a hedge fund, uh, from a hedge fund family. I, I didn't come with money. I'm very lucky. And how I got to this is another story. But uh, so I've got, um, I didn't go through art school. I took maybe two or three art courses in my life. Um, I was interested in poetry. I eventually got a degree in philosophy. And um, I did all these other things because I kept looking for something that I related to why, what makes life worth living? I think Leo referred to uh, art as maybe having a, an avenue towards meaning. I think most artists, either consciously or unconsciously, are assuming that um, in making art, in pursuing an artist's life, there is a kind of meaning. There will be a, a meaning. What's the point if you don't have a, a sense of meaning about it? And um, you also, I think, use the word transformation. I, I think all of us artists, um, have, we all experience a transformation. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that I'm a different person tomorrow than I am today, but you know, we all have that experience working in the studio of, as you said, maybe I look up and five hours have gone by. I mean, I am in a different state. That, that is transformation. I mean, in a moment, I am in a different state. My state is changing. And you will see, you will look at a lot of art and a lot of art won't do much for you. But then you'll suddenly come across a piece of art and it transforms you in that moment. It changes your state. And it's, there's something kind of magical about that. This kind of magic um, gives a kind of meaning, as far as I'm concerned. That kind of transformation, that, that kind of moment where, as again, Leo, to quote you, uh, I felt like I was actually living, you know, that is something that gives a person a sense of meaning to, to suddenly be feeling like, now I'm actually living. Um, I don't think we have a terribly good language for describing all this, and I'm not sure that the art world has a lot of theorists who are writing about this. My, the magazine comes out of basically my own disappointment with my encounter with the art world, uh, where I, I did not find in the writing, the critical writing in the, in the uh, very early 1980s I f and in the work, mostly I found nothing that really resonated with my actual experience. And uh, to make a long story short, eventually I think Works and Conversations was my answer to not finding a place in the art world and being rather disturbed by well, I, you know, like all of us, we want to have some recognition, we want to have some feedback. But I was disturbed by not finding certain things honored in the art world that, uh, to me, uh, absolutely needed to be honored. And I, I think they're, they're difficult to articulate, but they sort of come under the category of, uh, now I feel like I'm actually living. Now, how do you, talk about that? How do you honor that? Uh, what I eventually found was that by talking to artists and not reading critics, um, I'm not you know, totally against art criticism, but um, by talking to artists I found common ground. Um, the things that I'd experienced I could describe to other artists and they, they recognized that they'd experienced the same thing. And something you said Mildred, like, that we all have more in common than we have different, uh, our differences. I mean, there are these profound human commonalities 
which we, we really do share and which uh, I don't know who's writing about that and uh, who might be writing about it with a certain kind of authority. I don't know who's writing about that. Uh, it's very difficult if you're going to try and do it academically. You've got to construct all these bulwarks and defenses and make your case. It's very tedious and difficult. Eventually, I found, uh, and I started the magazine, well, it's, it's hard to explain how I started. I won't even try. It wasn't with a plan. But what I did discover fairly quickly was that the interview had the possibility, a good interview, as a literary form, as far as I am concerned, can carry the most substance. I mean, there's a poem, you, you might say poetry can carry more substance. Well, a good poem can carry tremendous substance. It's easier to do an interview than to write a really good poem. <laughs> uh, but, and if you do a good interview and you ask really real questions, sincere questions, and sort of probing questions, and you sort of try to track people down a little bit, what I found is that you get a tremendous amount of substance um, art articulated in a way that can be um, shared. And, and I think it can deeply move people. And I, I, and I think that's what's, what's happened to me. It's like finding a great secret. So I've just got some photos here I, um, of some of the people I've interviewed. And I've interviewed some famous, well-known people and, and many people who you won't know, people who are not known at all. And it doesn't really matter whether you're famous or not famous. If you have something profound to say, um, if anyone were to take an interest and ask you questions, you might be able to say some really important and interesting things. That's another thing I've discovered. And for me, it's extremely gratifying not only to talk to people like Mildred, who I interviewed, and, uh, and other, Jim Melchert, I mean, several of the other people here that have taught it at uh, UC. Not only is it gratifying to me to talk to many of these people who are very articulate and can speak from really authentic experience, but to, to run into people who no one knows about, who just have tremendous things to share. And uh, so that's happened. These two guys here, uh, found a city farmer in, in Vancouver. It, it's been around for 40 years. It's one of the very early urban farming sort of permaculture things. And it's uh, just, they're, they're, these guys, I could talk about every one of these uh, people I've interviewed for some time, but I can just tell you, all these interviews are on my website. They're all great interviews because of what these people have to bring. This guy, Jim Barton, chainsaw artist. This guy's amazing. Um, <laughs> incredible story. Um, I can only say that uh, it'd really be worth your time to go read the interview with Jim Barton or any of these people. Where is he? He's, uh, he's near Portland. Uh, the guy uses a huge chainsaw like, a, uh, like Pablo Casals runs a, a cello. I mean, <laughs> you know, and then he has all these sm smaller tools. He does lots of Quan Yens and Buddhas. Uh, he, he's pretty amazing. Well, uh, Carl Chang over on the left, and there's J Michael McMillan, two tremendous artists. Um, that's in Michael McMillan's backyard. We interviewed both of those guys, they're wonderful. Here's uh, Carlo Ferretti, a local guy. Nobody knows who Carlo is. He's an amazing guy, Italian architect, non-practicing. He made this beautiful thing out by the Albany Bulb, piece of public art. It's a miracle he got it done. When it was dedicated, no one even mentioned his name. He lost money on it. But he wasn't even angry about it. <laughs> it's a beautiful character. Kevin Forrest, uh, incredible gardener down out of San Jose. Uh, Cheryl Leonard makes musical instruments out of all kinds of things. I didn't interview her, uh, but I took that photo. All right, Clayton, that's uh, Clayton from a few years ago, Clayton Bailey. He's got a show at Trax Gallery right now, and he's, uh, his work is at the Berkeley Art Center right now. And that Didn't he have that museum that wasn't, yeah. a, it wasn't a museum? The, uh, was that Trax in L.A.? No, it was, it was in... It was well, in, up, up at Port Costa, Port he's Costa. got his uh, Kaolithic yeah. Museum of Kaolithic Wonders. And then, <laughs> You know, Dr. Gladstone and the, the Bigfoot skeleton and God knows what all. Clayton's an incredible character. 
Uh, David Parker, fantastic photographer from England. Dixon Snyder, not, not too well known. He's a really good painter, lives in Alameda. Stephen DeStabler, a lot of you people know Stephen. Isn't that a beautiful photograph? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing Oh my God, Stephen, I just fell in love with Stephen. John Toki sent me to interview Stephen. A guy named, do you know Demetrio Bra Braceros? He's, I don't think he's with us anymore. There's a, a, a San Francisco public park, Cayuga Park. He ran it. Um, no one knew who, who had carved that hundred plus beautiful figures and art pieces around the park. It, they're all done by this little guy, Demetrios. He's got a cowhide on. Quietly, you know, yeah. I mean. <clears throat> Eddie Brooks, he makes handmade saddles. <laughs> Elaine Ling, she's a medical doctor in Toronto. She goes all over the, she's about five foot two or one, maybe one. She lugs a view camera all around the world into the most remote places, making incredible photographs. Frederick Feirstein lives here in Berkeley. Pretty cool looking guy, isn't he? You know, how many of you know that statue down at the foot of university, that weird figure? That's Frederick. I read that plaque and I said, I gotta find this guy. <laughs> he was not easy to find. He's a tremendous artist, although um, he works as an electrician. I said, Frederick, what kind of, I mean, he, he was showing me these ceramic things he'd done, unbelievable stuff. I said, Frederick, what kind of a, tell me about your art career. He said, art career? I don't have an art career. He said, there's no such thing as an art career in this country. <laughs> Gail Wagner. Gail, I like the photo because if, if you know Gail, you know he's like, uh, it's kind of like Gail, right? <laughs> Godfrey Reggio, he made this incredible, the, uh, the films Koyanis Katsi, Pawa Katsi, and Nikoi Katsi. Unbelievable man. Uh, I'll just read the interview, you'll be totally blown away. Hadi Tabatabai, really interesting meditative artist, very profound and uh, Hung Lu, it's about 20 years ago. Um, Jim Brooks, a guy, a stranger I met in Elko, Nevada. It was just so interesting looking. I ended up asking him to, to be interviewed. Unbelievable story, this guy. Uh, Judy Pfaff. That was down in Pasadena. <clears throat> it's a great interview I did with Judy, thanks to Jane Rosen. James Hubble, really interesting character, lives down around San Diego. He's done a lot of stuff, all kinds of things. Jane Rosen, some of you might know Jane. She taught here. Didn't she teach at Stanford also? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah I like drawing. Yeah. Here. Jane is a fantastic person. Uh, she was, um, took her 10 years going back and forth between New York and here to, to figure, finally decide to move out here permanently. But before she moved out here permanently, she was offered a, a, uh, a tenured position at Bard. She turned it down to come out here. And, you know, there's Jim Barton again. Uh, Jim Campbell. Oh, yeah. You just got to, you know, to me, Jim is one of the most amazing artists I know. Yes. James Doolin, um, oh, James. Los Angeles. Yeah. He died a short, I don't know, a year and a half after I interviewed him, a tremendous yeah. painter. There's uh, Jim Brooks again. And <laughs> no introduction needed. <laughs> So I did a nice interview with Jim, but as anybody who knows Jim, just being around him for a while, you're gonna hear wonderful stuff. <laughs> this interview is in the current issue. Uh, this, this woman's story to me is the most amazing, uh, one of the most amazing I've heard in a long time. And uh, she is a graduate of the Art Institute, but is a, an unknown artist and uh, you just have to grab a copy of the magazine and read about her. What's her name? Oh, Joe. Joe. He was back oh, there. He was back there. <sighs> Joan DiStefano. J 
Joan DiStefano, and she's teaching at the GTU, which is amazing because she, uh, she took, a, they made her take these qualifying tests uh, originally when she wanted to, to, uh, to be a student at the GTU and do a doctoral program. And they told her that she got the lowest score on the uh, math in the history, <laughs> in the history of the test. <laughs> And she said, well, really, is there a letter? Can I have that letter? Can I have it framed? And, and, and they would not give her admit, uh, they would not allow her to, to have admittance because of that. You can't study, you can't uh, do a PhD on this uh, saint because your math score is so low. Is that ridiculous? I mean, and now she's teaching there. There's Joe Slusky. <laughs> John Abdul Johnny. <laughs> he carved some amazing animals down in uh, West Oakland. Did you know he, has, he and uh, Viola had worked together for a oh, period I, of time? I didn't know that. Yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. John Mason. Uh, John Toki. Um, if you don't know John Toki, you should. He's a local, wonderful tremendously generous, knowledgeable man. He sent me down to interview John Mason in L.A., and that was a great experience. Oh, yeah. Catherine Sherwood. I interviewed her. She's, uh, she's great. Lee Hyams, quite an interesting woman. She was the uh, studio assistant for... Uh, oh, boy. I'm forgetting the artist's name. Guy that did the figures with the pointed hats, the Ku Klux Klan driving around in these. Philip Gustin. Gustin, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, uh, Lisa Koken, Melanie Demore, she's a local, she's a singer, and uh, she'll be in the next, the upcoming issue. An incredible interview with her. Mark Bullwinkle. Oh yeah. Local renegade. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin Sanders, here's a guy that nobody's gonna know. Oh yeah, he used to run the music program at the Berkeley That is fantastic Center. knowledge. I, I met Marvin, uh, he was taking tickets, and uh, just to make conversation, I, I said, uh, somehow he told me he was a musician, he played the flute, and I said, you're jazz? And he says, you're saying jazz because I'm a black man, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, I said, I was a little taken, I said, yeah, that's true. And then we got in the most incredible conversation. I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, after that evening, which was a small film festival thing that I'd put together with Robin Henderson, we went out afterwards for drinks, and I got in a conversation with Marvin. And he told me how he'd been living on the street and uh, how he'd been given a flute when he was 19, and he loved it. He told me this whole story, and I was so blown, blown away by his story, I asked if, if uh, he'd mind giving an interview, which I did. And he's a beautiful man, Marvin is, and it's an incredible story. He, he eventually got his degree from, I don't know if it was Berkeley in music, but he's really amazing, and he's one of these people that just people don't know about him. The people that read that interview, it's like, this is the real deal. Oh. Hey, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> A few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Another of Michael McMillan. Michael Miller from Louisiana, incredible potter, wood fired kilns, wonderful guy. This guy, Milford Zorns, he's 92. I was down in Claremont wandering around to kill some time. I went into this art place and I started looking through these kind of boring paintings. No one would come out. I was alone. I thought, what the heck? This I'm here by myself. No one's around. So I just kept looking. And I thought, I'm going to try and find at least one painting that I think is kind of interesting out of about 100 paintings. Or, and I found a couple. Finally, a guy comes in the door who was a shopkeeper and basically said nothing to me. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy's a real salesperson, you know? Uh, <laughs> Finally, I, I thought, you know, I've got time to kill. I'm going to take this as a challenge. I'm going to engage this guy in conversation, draw him out, just see if it's possible. 
<laughs> and uh, so I finally got him to tell a little bit, yeah, this is about the California painters. Or there's some name of a bunch of painters, they're good painters, watercolor painters, back in the 30s. Or, and I said, uh, okay, and, uh, and what's your name? Mike, yeah, Mike what? Mike Verbal. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that was, he's, he's a good guy. I don't I mean, it was very funny. But I said, okay, who did this painting here? Milford Zorns. I thought, wow, that's a name, Milford Zorns. I said, so, so, so tell me a little bit about Milford. Well, Milford's 92, he's blind. Oh yeah, okay, and he's giving a uh, watercolor workshop next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> you, wait, 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 you said he's blind, yeah? And he's giving, uh, he's giving a watercolor workshop? Yeah? Does this guy live around here? Yeah? Could, could, could you give me his phone number? <laughs> <laughs> I ended up interviewing this guy that same afternoon. Unbelievable. He was not literally blind. I, like an idiot, I, when I met him at the door, I handed him the magazine, and I thought, oh my God, he's blind. You know what he's, <laughs> But he holds it up to his, you know, and he says, that's a nice looking cover. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this guy, he's really, it's a great thing. Nathan Oliveira. Oh, yeah. Great interview. All right, Peter Sells. <laughs> Quincy Troop, that was from, uh, yeah. thanks to Mildred. Uh, Mildred and I interviewed Quincy Troop, and it was so much fun meeting Quincy and his wife, Margaret, right? Yeah. My God, that was so memorable. The guy has a great spirit. Oh, Ri great Richard Berger. Um, you know, there are some amazing folks around here, and uh, Richard Berger is one of them, and maybe he hasn't been given the recognition he probably deserves. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth. <laughs> it's a squeak a few years ago. Said Nuseba, a passionate guy, a Palestinian American photographer, very intense. Sam Perry, he'll be in the portfolio of his work in the next issue. There's Marvin, again, the uh, flute player. John Toki. Oh, Ursula von Radinsvard. Vi Viola Fry is back there in the... Yeah. I, she was the toughest interview I ever, ever did. But I got a pretty good interview eventually. Wow. And why... Well, well, the the biggest problem with Viola f for me was that you know, she'd talk about technical stuff, no problem. But if I wanted to get anything about what did you feel, what did you think, what was your no, she was no, 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 no. I don't go there. And she was very incredibly sensitive to any question that asked to go inside of her. And and in fact. I mean, she'd also suffered some serious, uh, she had a stroke, some, a lot of surgery, so her cognitive functioning or her language stuff was not as it had been, although she was still articulate. But uh, at one point, and I, I think I'm a pretty sensitive, discreet uh, person when I interview people, and I just felt, my God, I'm so clumsy, I'm so intrusive, I'm so incompetent. Every, you know, every, and I started feeling worse and worse and worse about myself. And a funny thing happened, it's never happened to me in my life. Something started welling up from down below in me, this feeling of affection, really a feeling of love for this person just came up out of nowhere. And I just felt a real sense of love for this person. And I can't even explain it. Um, I asked her if she'd let me take some photos. No, no photos. So I snuck this one. <laughs> Wanjin Zhang, some of you have seen his incredible sculptures, these big ceramic warrior figures. He's an amazing artist. Wendy Sussman. Yeah, an amazing, amazing painter, Wendy. Incredible. <clears throat> There's a guy I met out in Trona, which is Nowheresville, out near Death Valley, outsider artist William Fuller, did a little portfolio of his work. 
That's a guy named uh, Andre Enard, a French artist who was a student of uh, hmm, one of those famous French guys. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.